and welcome back to part two of this video in which we are examining the rise of operations research and think tanks which have created a way of thinking about the future that is scenario driven and heavily influenced by the logics and organization of the Cold War era. In the last part, we discussed Hermann Kahn's concept of Megadeth, which was a much needed warning regarding the desolate future that would result from a nuclear war in the 1960s. However, in the current era, we are starting to see the emergence of different technologies that could result in an even worse dystopian reality. Australian artificial intelligence researcher Hugh DeGaris posited the term gigadeath to describe the projected death of billions of people following the type of future war between agents of artificial intelligence. This would not necessarily be a human versus machine war, as with James Cameron's Terminator series, but what DeGaris calls an artelect war, in which the cosmist faction who supports the artificial intelligent godlike machines he calls Artelex, and the Terrans, who oppose them. These two factions would go to war, which Degaris predicts happening sometime before the end of the 21st century. Degaris published a book in 2005 describing his views on this topic titled The Artelect War. Cosmists versus Terrans, a bitter controversy concerning whether humanity should build godlike, massive, intelligent machines. There's a link to a fascinating interview with Degaris in the description and via the subject Moodle site. To switch gears and go back to operations research and think tanks, another important RAND outcome was the popularization of the Delphi method, which had a major impact on operations research techniques. Named after the Oracle of Delphi, the Delphi method uses groups of experts and multiple rounds of anonymized questionnaires to focus on key issues and develop forecasts for the future. One of the first uses of the Delphi method in 1964 reported on the long-term trends in science and technology development, population control, automation, space exploration, weapon technology, and the prevention of war. Specific technologies considered in the Delphi report included vehicle and highway management, automation and robotics, educational technologies, and high-speed networked communications. Two of the authors of that report Theodore J. Gordon and Olaf Helmer and others from RAND created the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto, California in 1968 to explore possible desirable futures and seek the means to enhance their potential reality. The Institute forecast social economic trends and their future implications and was unlike RAND and other think tanks at the time as it made its studies available directly to the public. Operations research became very popular during the Cold War, and by 1968, RAND was deeply embedded in the US Department of Defense and worked with other government departments and services that were looking to go beyond short-term planning. However, operations research and think tanks led to more than military strategy, and in Paris in 1973, the World Futures Studies Federation held a conference dedicated to peace and imagining operational research and futures studies at a global level. Although, as Wendell Bell argues, the majority of futures research was dominated by the war managers until the 1990s and the end of the Cold War. Another important development in the 1970s was the book The Limits of Growth, which was based on research funded by Germany's largest think tank and research institute, the Volkswagen Foundation, not connected to the automotive industry. The limits of growth predicted that population and industrial growth will stop in the 21st century, based on variables including war, global trade, industrial output per capita, energy availability, and so on. The authors concluded that sustainability can only occur if we find alternative energy sources and drastically restrict population growth. 
the limits of growth was attacked by the left for ignoring the conditions experienced by the poor, and it was attacked by the right for failing to take into account scientific developments that would help build other solutions, such as better nuclear-powered energy sources and new agricultural technologies. But the book had a big impact on the development of global modelling and alongside Rachel Carson's environmental science book, Silent Spring, The Limits of Growth helped to make environmentalism a foundational element of forecasting and prediction. Think tanks have an important relationship with the media and communication industries because as organizations dedicated to informing politicians, advocating and lobbying for particular future strategies, and in conducting research for public policy, they rely heavily on experts in communications and media to get their messages across. Think tanks rely directly on communication with politicians through networking. They require social media platforms and web-based media to interface broadly with public audiences. And they use events like conferences and panel presentations to promote and share their work with researchers, especially within the private sector industries. The relationship between think tanks and the media industries goes back to the UK think tank, the Fabian Society. Britain's oldest think tank, which was famous for its use of printed pamphlets since the end of the 19th century. Think tanks are often described as ideas factories, but that is only half their role, as writer Jonathan Rowe commented. Think tanks don't just think, they justify, they advocate, they communicate and sell their ideas, and they require media strategies and professionals to do that effectively. Think tanks are most often criticised for favouring right-wing solutions over left-wing ones, particularly in terms of economy, environmentalism and social policy. A Guardian editorial from 2018 describes UK think tanks as primarily funded by the dark money from secretive billionaires seeking to influence elections and change the broader political landscape, calling them fronts for vested interests concealed under a veneer of mock academia and questionable charitable status. A link to that article is in the description and available via the subject Moodle page. Although Australia is quite a small country in terms of its population, just close to 25 million, we have quite a few think tanks, with 48 listed on the Wikipedia page, which range from very small to very large organisations. These think tanks are typically divided into the binary political spectrum of left and right, and while there are centrist think tanks and impartial think tanks, The majority, particularly in Australia, are aligned with the major political parties, their values, histories and traditions. Over the years, there have been many attempts by Australian journalists to uncover the degrees of ties between think tanks, political parties, corporations and private funding. There are numerous examples of Australian journalists working to uncover the funding arrangement for national think tanks, and the ABC Media Watch series has an important episode on funding disclosure that I will also add a link to. One of the role of journalists is to ask questions about the influence that organisations like think tanks have over government policy and examine their relationship to private and corporate funding much of which is kept secret and hidden from the public. As this video is designed for students studying media and communication at an Australian university, I thought it might be useful to take a closer look at some of our nation's biggest think tanks. First is the Centre for Independent Studies, which is based in Sydney and founded in 1976 by Greg Lindsay. The CIS is described as a classic liberal conservative think tank in the Australian, not the American sense of the word, and modelled on the UK's Institute of Economic Affairs. CIS policies favour market deregulation, limiting the size and scope of government, and this includes reduction in the funding and services provided by governments to families, the unemployed, immigrants and refugees. The CIS was heavily in favour of the coalition government's approach to issues like the deregulation of shopping hours, 
and its research and lobbying agenda has been funded by many of the large corporations in Australia over the years, from McDonald's to BHP and Philip Morris. The Melbourne-based Institute of Public Affairs, the IPA, is another highly conservative think tank based in Melbourne, which was established during the Second World War in 1943. The IPA is connected to senior Liberal Party figures and its economic policies focus on the deregulation of the Australian economy, lower taxation, abolishing the minimum wage and the privatisation of national government bodies. IPA funding has included sources like Western Mining, BHP and Telstra, among others. And although the funding ties are unclear, the IPA received public support from mining magnate Gina Reinhart, media emperor Rupert Murdoch, former Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott, and the Roman Catholic Cardinal George Pell. The IPA has been an extensive supporter of Australian climate change sceptics. The Chifley Research Centre is a think tank that is operated by the Australian Labor Party. It is a non-profit organisation, so the centre is able to fundraise and donate funds directly to the Labor Party. The centre describes itself as a progressive organisation with a social democratic foundation. But from its website, it can be said to be actively involved in recording and publishing the history of the Labor Party. Its primary policy focus is work and labour relations, but it also contributes to general economic policy and environmental and social policy. Its corporate benefactors have included BHP and Woodside Australian Energy. Other left-wing and centrist think tanks do exist, including Per Capita, the Australian Institute, the Social Policy Research Centre at the University of New South Wales, and the Green Institute. And for those of you studying media and communication with an interest in whichever side of politics, there are many types of jobs and roles at think tanks that are often advertised on sites like Seek.com. I want to begin to conclude this video with an important point about the type of future that operations research and think tanks specialize in. In the book, The Future, a very short introduction by Jennifer M. Gidley. There's a great section on historian Jenny Anderson's view on think tanks as part of a quest to domesticate the future. She argues that the operations research and think tank approach to the future is to bring it under control through the logic of scientific positivism embedded in a general theory of prediction that is the product of the Cold War period from the 1950s and 1960s. Gidley cites Anderson's reference to the RAND Corporation's specialization in trying to perfect the science of predicting through developing a diverse range of predictive techniques, mainly based on mathematical methods and relying on then newly acquired computational power. RAND built an epistemic Cold War arsenal. These techniques were used to know an enemy whose future behavior was to be revealed through forms of virtual experimentation and synthetic fact in the absence of conventional knowledge. As we discussed in previous videos, there are those involved in futures studies who draw on operations research methods and who work for think tanks. However, there is also a recognition that the science of forecasting and the mathematical and statistical models for prediction are framed around the idea that there is a single future that we are inevitably moving towards, like a road or a track, that it can be tied down and locked in with the precise probability framework. There is another view in future studies that doesn't view the future as one single territory that can be colonized and controlled, but rather advocates for pluralism and argues that there are many different and possible futures that we can imagine, design, and create collaboratively. That's one of the reasons we spend so much time with science fiction in this subject, to remind ourselves of the many different visions for the future that those in the creative industries are actively building for us to imagine what kinds of futures we want and don't want. The epistemology, or the way of understanding the world, of RAND and think tanks is largely a product of the Cold War era. But as Wendell Bell argues, science doesn't constitute a unified way of thinking. Rather, science is many different ways of thinking, each relative to a particular topic and community of scientists that it involves. People often mistake this for a weakness. 
Climate skeptics deny the scientific consensus on climate change, pointing to the many different theories, models and forecasts as a failure to prove man-made global warming. However, as Gidley argues, 21st century science has moved on from the closed system and mechanical worldview of the Cold War era to an increasingly pluralistic understanding open to new possibilities of complexity, which means that although the warning signs and predictions are dire, it is not too late for us to contribute meaningfully and transform the present to improve the predictions for the future. Remember, the future is now.